Janice Engel is an award-winning filmmaker who has made numerous documentaries and nonfiction television specials and series, including Jackson Brown, Going Home, Ted Hawkins, Amazing Grace, and the documentary series, Addicted. Janice is a professor at the Academy of Art University in San Francisco, where she teaches documentary film. She's a longtime resident of Los Angeles and a member of the Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences. Please join me in welcoming Janice Engel. Janice? You want to take your picture? You want to take your picture? Yeah. Hey, there's something. Oh, I have a mic on. There's something that I always do, and I usually do it before the, the show, but since you're all still here, can I get the house lights for a second? I'm going to take your picture, because this moment will never, ever happen again. So on the count of three, I'm going to yell, one, two, three, and you're going to yell, raise hell. Because Molly's listening, and she wants you all to do that. Are you ready? One, two, three. Raise hell. That was mighty fine, y'all. <laughs> well, uh, Janice, uh, by the way, before we get started here, we're going to have a discussion for a few minutes, but... I want to introduce uh, Carlisle Vandervoort, who is a producer for this uh, documentary. And Carlisle is a uh, native Houstonian and is also happily a graduate of this university. So Carlisle, please stand and be recognized. It's my producing partner, y'all. So um, Janice, you, you've told me that of course, you've never met Molly. No. And uh, actually, I think you confessed to me that you really didn't know who Molly was. Is this correct? And uh, out in L.A. Uh, I'm not going to make any comments about that, but at any rate. Uh, yeah, in New York also, that's true. Uh, so how did this happen? I mean, you didn't know about her. So, um, yeah, I, I admit that to everybody. I am uh, born and raised in New York and uh, then moved to the other left coast, Los Angeles, to go to college, to go to university at USC. Um, I had heard of Molly, but just in passing, you know, I, I, I didn't read her columns, and ashamed to say, I really didn't know about her, and I, um, I wasn't part of her constituency because, like, I, I'm, you know, both coasts. Mm -hmm. And um, so in, I had heard of her because I had heard the term shrub. Shrub. And, yes, and I knew that she had kept come up with that, and I think I had seen her probably on Letterman one night, but that's about it. In 2012, our other producing partner, James Egan, um, had wanted to make a film with me for a while, and he called me and said, you need to go see this play that's on in Ge at the Geffen Playhouse in Westwood uh, in Los Angeles uh, called Red Hot Patriot, the Kick-Ass Wood of Molly Ivins. Do you know who she is? And I said, my name's familiar. He said, D -d -d just, it's the closing this week, Kathleen Turner starring it, go see it. And he knew the playwright. So I went to see this it. This is the Kathleen Turner. Uh, yes. Yeah. I went to see it, and uh, I got <clears> one <throat> ticket and sat in the third row. And I was blown away by the material. Kathleen was good, but the material was Molly. And I laughed my ass off. It was a laugh a minute. And I came home, and I Googled her till 2 or 3 in the morning. And... I found all these C-SPAN clips. I, I was like, wow. So I called James, and I said, she's amazing. What's the story? He said, nothing's ever been done. I said, nothing's ever been done. He said, nope, no documentary, nothing. And I said, what do we got to do? So through the uh, playwrights, the Engel sisters, who, by the way, spelled their last name the same way as I do, E-N-G-E-L, and we're not related, um, put us in touch with Molly's chief of stuff, Betsy Moon, who was here in the audience. Betsy, say, hey, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so um, Betsy, IMDB, James and I found out we were for real. We were who we said we were. And then put us in touch with Molly's estate. And while all this was going on, um, we were waiting for the green light and approval, which her estate is the, she left her estate to the Texas Observer and the ACLU. We knew we needed a Texan. 
we're both from the, I'm from New York, James is from Baltimore, we live in LA, I mean, what do we know really about Texas? And we both had a mutual, very, very, my best friend, James's close friend, who was a Texan. And uh, we said, hmm, Carlisle Vandervoort, and I think I said, she deserves this. And we called her up, and James hard pressed her, gave her 48 hours. She called us back in less than 12, and she said, I'm in. And now, what's interesting, too, is two things. Carlisle, not only is a Texan and a Houstonian, she grew up in the same neighborhood as Molly Ivins in River Oaks, and she went to the same private school, St. John's. She is also a child of oil and gas privilege, and she was an uh, activist in her own right in the LBGTQ mm -hmm. community. Yeah. So it, it's in her blood. And she, as she likes to tell us, we were the carpetbaggers, and basically we needed Carlisle. I mean, we don't know how to talk to people who have money, and you, documentarians, you need money to make a film. And Carlisle does and did. And so we got the green light, and I want to say five weeks later, I was on a plane to Texas and, and down to Austin with Carlisle, and we did our first six interviews, and we had our first fundraiser at the Church of Hightower, Jim Hightower's office, which is in a church, and we raised our first $17,000, and we were off and running. Speaking of money, uh, other than <laughs> fundraising, which everybody that has anything to do with the documentary, making a documentary film has to worry about, that's probably the number one challenge, is getting funding. What other challenges, though, did you have in, in making this? I mean, what was the hardest part of doing this? What did you have to do? Were there any problems at all in doing this? Well, there's always problems, yes, you say. Finding the money is, is the hardest thing of all, for sure. But the second hardest thing, or equally as hard, is really digging in. I, I when I make films, um, no matter if they're on a person, and I've made a number of documentaries on people, or a subject, you have to do a deep dive. It's a commitment. It's an archaeological dig into someone's life. How long did you work on this? Six plus years. Y'all live in here at the Briscoe. Um, thank you, Don. And his staff, his staff, Mar Margaret Schlanke and, and um, her colleagues uh, were uh, essential. And Betsy Moon basically brokered that for me. Um, I had to climb a mountain called Molly. And that's what I've been doing for six plus years. And um, her, her, her archive is enormous. Somebody once said that they, Molly knew she was going to be famous. I don't know about that, but she was a pack rat. And she had notes that her father had left her on the kitchen counter from when she was a kid. So I don't think I really, I mean, I, I you know, I'm an instinct, intuitive person. I would look at through the Briscoe and I would say, I want this, I want this, I want. I was always looking for pictures, I was looking for video. I was looking for the, the as you saw, and journal entries, diary entries, things that would reveal who she really was. And what I, um, and I had to come back and that takes money and I, and I had to spend time. And I don't have that luxury of time. I did, obviously, but I mean, I had to work while I was making this uh, to pay my mortgage. And I would come back and I would basically live in the archives for periods of time. And I also didn't have the luxury to read through stuff while I was there. So what I cleverly did was bring a really nice little camera right. and put it on a stand. Yeah. And I would find her documents. And I did hire a boots on the ground researcher to help me. And we would just go through stuff. Minneapolis Tribune, we'd look for certain key points in her life. And I would take photos, raw and JPEG. I didn't want to have to come back. I didn't want it to cost you guys right. money. And I took raw photos because I knew if I'm going to use something, I could then blow it up and it would be good quality for, for a feature. And um, I said I came back after, I don't know, I think I've spent a, probably a total of six to eight months at different times mm -hmm. over the past, I'd say, five years. From 2012 to 2018. Is that why we have a chair with your name on it? And the, I, okay. Can I get that, please? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, so I, I, I came back and I said to my producing partners, they said, um, well, what'd you guess? And I, you know, I took all these pictures. And when I really started to assess it, I thought I had maybe 500 to 1,000. I had over 3,000. And I went through each and every one of them, and I cataloged them. And I organized it by not only themes in Molly's life, but also Molly's life. And everything had, it was very, very specific how I went through. And I made copious notes. And at that actually process, it drove my producing partners crazy. Carlisle can attest to that. It took me 18 months to do that. And that's a lot of work. But it also helped the process in terms of 
Then I edited for five years before I brought an editor on, culling, culling, culling down. And I think that's, I, we started talking about two years ago. Yes. I, you know, the thing about Molly, uh, I talked to Molly for years about her papers, and she really expressed to me that she had no interest in that whatsoever. And just really, but she had this, as you say, this pack rat aspect to her that thankfully, from a historian's point of view, uh, she did keep stuff, but she, she always downplayed it. And I just need to give credit to John Henry Falk's widow, Liz Falk, who and you interviewed on this. Liz became Molly's assistant. Yes. And Liz called me several times and would go, I've got a whole bunch of stuff in a box. I'm gonna, it's coming to your, your way. And she really saved a whole lot of Molly's material, with Molly's blessing. But she, I just want to give credit in terms of the stuff that you had. Well, I just lost my microphone. Uh, I wanted to give Liz credit. The filmmaker. I'll just tell you. This is so nice. Yeah, we lost our. Here we we lost go. our. Well, at any rate, I wanted to give. I wanted to. I wanted to give credit to it. <laughs> yeah, we just switch roles here. That's good. Um, so, what do you? What do you want people to take away from when they see this documentary? What do you want them to take away from it? I mean, what kind of impact? What do, What are you looking for here in terms of impact? I'm just going to get. I'm going to give credit to Betsy Moon too for basically also uh, after Liz Falk it was Betsy Moon yeah and she that's really, true yeah that's I true. want to give credit to Betsy um, I want people so you know Molly was a First Amendment warrior and she loved y'all she loved Texas she loved people she loved the process and she loved democracy and we are living in very threatening times she's more relevant now than when she was alive. And, and she said it, you know? You know, it's up to us. You know, Jim Hightower says it's up to us to do the heavy lifting. You know, she says, this is our deal. In that speech that was on Idaho Public TV, and when she said that this is our deal, I, the first time I saw that, and I still to this day get chills, because she was talking to the interviewer, and when she said, this is our deal, she looked directly in the camera. She was looking at all of you and me. It is our deal. We are the deciders. Those people up in your state capitals, Washington, they're just the people we've hired to drive the bus for a while. And we have to have campaign finance reform. We must overturn Citizens United. <laughs> so the takeaway is that it is up to us and for y'all, you gotta tell your children and your grandchildren this is, somebody said in uh, one of the newspapers, we've had a slew of amazing reviews, that this is a gift to the online generation. And I have showed it to some of my students and they are knocked out because they understand they're being handed a pile of shit. And they need a blueprint of what to do. Well, bang them pots and pans, get out in the streets, and basically get rid of the, I'm sorry, but toppling of the white male patriarchy, no offense to my, my friends, but it is time. A hundred and one, you know, fresh, fresh, freshman congresswomen, we're moving in the right direction, but it's got to happen faster. So, so in, in conclusion, people ask me, I've seen this three or four times now, and I get something out of it different every time I see it, but people are always asking me, uh, since you hit the festival circuit, uh, where, where they can go see this film. So you may not want to talk about this, but how, how are we doing on that? I mean, where, where you, do you hope that uh, people will be able to see it in the future? Very soon, hopefully, by the summer, or within the summer, coming to a theater near you. We've just... <laughs> I'm happy to say that we have uh, picked a distributor and it is somebody who basically is a major distributor for documentaries and knows the playbook because they distributed RBG. Okay, on that note, thank you.